Germany is known for its research worldwide. But what are the options if you are looking for funding for your PhD or postdoc? I am your host Paras Mehta and today I'll be speaking with Dr. Brian Cahill about funded PhD and postdoc opportunities in Germany. Brian is a highly experienced researcher and a member of the governing board of Euroscience. He has extensive knowledge of the research landscape in Germany and Europe and is a former chair of the Marie Curie Alumni Association and the association's chapter in Germany. Brian gives in-depth information and advice about the Marie Curie Fellowship and an overview of other opportunities such as the Humboldt Fellowship and DAAD. Brian, you have a lot of experience in Germany in research and also in in Europe in general. And now you are at the moment a part of the Euroscience Governing Board. So what brought you to Euroscience and to your control? At first, I came to Germany when I was um, straight after my master's degree, and I worked in industry for uh, Hewlett-Packard and Agilent Technologies, writing manuals um, in Stuttgart for two years. And after that, I, I was 23, 24, 25, and around that age. And I looked around, and I wanted to do something more than writing manuals. I really loved working in industry. But one weekend, I went to Zurich to uh, just to visit with some friends. And I looked around, and I thought I could, I could live here in Switzerland. And then I saw a position um, at the Swiss Institute, Federal Institute of Technology, the ETH, in Zurich. And um, I applied for it. And I got the job as a PhD student student and um or phd assistant as it was called i really had a great time in zurich and doing phd and it was quite uh scientifically very very interesting and productive time for me so um after i finished um phd uh i decided to stay in switzerland but to move to french switzerland from german switzerland and also to move from I was working in the nanotechnology group in Zurich, um, but in the mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering department. And after that, I moved into chemistry because uh, a lot of the work that I was doing in the PhD was about surface chemistry and kind of char- charged surfaces. So between mechanical, electrical and uh, engineering and um and sort of the chemistry of, of surfaces. So from that, I moved into a postdoc in kind of um, in colloid and interface science, and I designed um, some a device for measuring surface reflection, laser reflection at the surface to measure absorption of molecules. So I think for for me that was a great developmental opportunity, and I. I learned a lot in those two years, but I wanted to move back into something that was closer to application and closer to engineering. And that was ha- how I applied for a Marie Curie Fellowship in Germany again. So I had been to Germany, moved to Switzerland, and I moved back to Germany using a Marie Curie Fellowship. And uh, after that, I moved to an institute where we did um, applications of microfluidics in biotechnology for about 10 years. I got involved in Euroscience mainly because I was involved in the Marie Curie Alumni Association before. And through working with MCAA, I was involved in supporting researchers to um, develop their careers and to represent the interests of researchers uh, in Europe and, and in the world. And from that, I met some people involved in Euroscience. I had been to the Euroscience Open Forum which is a big um, conference on general science and on science policy, on research careers, on gender equality, on um, bridging science and business. That happens every two years. And this uh, conference made a big uh, impact on me personally. And I got to know some people and it was suggested to me that I might be interested in joining the governing board. So I applied and I was elected. So um, I think from being part of Euroscience, I can contribute to many of the same issues, but also kind of to to wider science policy. So I think that career issues for junior researchers are important, but 
I think it's I think through Euroscience we also deal with with many other general science topics. Oh, that sounds great. So you you moved from uh, Switzerland back to Germany with a Marie Curie fellowship. Uh, so you are a former Marie Curie fellow, and you are also former chair of the Marie Curie Alumni Association and its German chapter. So what is the Marie Curie program all about? Um, the Marie Curie program is the main program of the European Commission that supports early career researchers. Um, not exclusively early career researchers, but mainly. Um, that it's, it's, a, it's a program that's named after Marie Curie, who was probably the most famous female scientist in history. Um, and was also a very prominent um, scientist who moved country at the very beginning of her academic career. When she was studying, she left Poland, which was then part of Russia, and moved to France. And the Marie Curie program is focused on um, researchers who are internationally mobile. All Marie Curie projects have some sort of international mobility, and this is usually the the mobility of a young scientist or young researcher who moves. I think this is the main um, important point about the program, but it's also about um, doing excellent science. Uh, and it's also focused on interdisciplinarity and intersectorality. So it's about research that could offer perspective for the researcher to be hired in academia, but also out of, outside of academia so that you can have some sort of connection with society. That there are four main types of um, action that are supported by the Marie skodowska curie actions. There is firstly the innovative training networks. These are, are uh, consortia, so groups of different um, academic hosts, but also companies that are involved in a project that hosts up to 15 PhD candidates. So um, in this way, you can have maybe three researchers working at a university in Germany in the project and two at a university in Poland, two more working at a company in Belgium, and three more working at a university in Ireland, and that they work on related topics uh, in a project where they build a, an international network that supports each other and where joint activities are organized for research training and transferable skills training. So I think this program, I wasn't involved in it, but I have the feeling that the people who are involved in, in these networks, that it works really well, the connections between the researchers and also the research teams uh, within these networks. And have been very, very influential in doctoral training within Europe uh, and how to train um, PhD candidates to develop many, many skills. The other main program is the individual fellowship. Um, the individual fellowship is a postdoctoral fellowship program where you apply by writing a proposal to the, to, and submitting it uh, for a deadline once a year to the European Commission, and then it's evaluated. And the best proposals, we hope, are selected to, to, uh, selected to, to be funded. This is is a, it's the, was the main original fellowship program in the Marie Curie program in the 90s. There are also um, a co-fund program which where universities or research funders or other organizations can apply to host a, either a doctoral program or a postdoctoral program. And in some ways, this is these are quite similar to the ITNs, but um, with one a university or consortium of universities or other research funders uh, joining together to run their own program. It, as the name suggests, is a co-fund program, which means that it's partially funded by the European Union and partially funded from other means. Um, there's also RISE, which is um, it's a staff exchange program. It's a little bit more complicated, but it means that that you can have a consortium of different partners who join together to fund, to run a program that allows staff to be exchanged between different institutions. This is maybe interesting because Indian uh, universities could also be 
involved or universities from any country in the world or almost any country in the world. Um, the duration of the programs depends on uh, which program you apply for. Generally, the postdoc fellowships are two years long and the PhD fellowships are three years long. This means that that's the length of the funding from the EU for the program. It means that particularly in the case of PhD, very often the, to get PhD you will need longer than three years. So that means to negotiating with the host to extend your contract or to find other ways of running. It's, it, it's quite complicated. But um, I think normally people finish maybe four years even maybe a little bit more than four years. So I think that this is is generally the case with research funding programs that you get funded for a particular amount of time for extending the project. There are ways of doing it, but that requires negotiation and working with your host organization. The, the funding involved and f- from the point of view of being paid depends a lot on which country you're hired in because uh, that's, Generally, they have a certain pot of money reserved for salary, but that also has to pay for pension contributions, um, not just from the employee, the fellow, but also from the employer. And that's very complicated to figure out exactly how much you will be paid. And it's very, very different between countries. So it's hard to say. I think in Germany, generally, the money is enough to live on. You won't get rich. (laughs) But... um, I think uh, with uh, with this sort of uh, program, it's I think that the money is better than some German researchers are paid, and in some cases, it's less. So it's it's hard to predict that you are given support to find housing, to settle in, and this is part of the application that the host uh, institution has to show that they will support the integration of the researcher in the research institution. So. I think you can expect to get um, some support, but this is very dependent on the international office in the university or your host supervisor or the secretary in the in the research group that you're going to work in very often. So I think this is, but it, that in general, that the host has to commit to provide support for, uh, for integrating the researcher, and most of them do. There is some funding for... Um, I think there is a certain amount that the researchers get paid for uh, in, at the beginning to pay for uh, flight costs for coming to Europe or to, to the research institution. And this is, uh, is part of the rules. Uh, you also asked me about um, kind of it being former chair of the Marie Curie Alumni Association and its German chapter. I first became chair of the German chapter of MCAA in early 2015. and. Uh, as running that chapter, I set up a program of, of a big meeting and a small meeting, uh, and but just to find ways to reach out to researchers in Germany who were in our association and to run events that would help them to develop their career and also to develop networks with each other. Um, I also engaged a lot on social media, or not so much social media, on our web platform to share information because uh, very often international researchers aren't very aware of what's going on in the country that they live in, particularly if a lot of the information is in German. So I provided a lot of information for for researchers so that they would know if there was a grant they could apply for or if there was an event going on or career fair. You know, simple stuff, but uh, just ways to if you see something that's going on that might be interesting to share it, because I think this is for me to be part of a network that you are really somebody who, who tries to share information. You can run events, but just to find ways to connect with people. Um, And through this work um, that I think we were relatively successful in Germany and we had a big increase in members. um, And then I was, approached by several people to become chair of the association when the when there was an opening. And for two years, I was chair of MCAA, um, the Marie Curie Alumni Association. And it was, it was a lot of work, but I met, met a lot of great people. And I think we got, we developed a lot of content for 
uh, the members of the association in terms of meetings, uh, webinars, activities where, that people could get involved in, the working, particularly setting up working groups and chapters um, for the working groups to cover particular areas such as science policy or career development or gender equality or bridging science and business so that we have a lot of activities of those sorts, but also um, chapters in countries because the association wasn't very old and there weren't very many chapters set up. So we set up chapters in India, for example, or Southeast Asia, China, in Brazil, um, also in many countries in Europe, including in Ireland, where I come from, but also in um, sort of Czech Republic or in Switzerland or different parts of Europe so that we could, um, you know, because sometimes it's easier to reach people at a local level. So we set up a lot of those sort of activities. But uh, after two years, I decided to step down and I moved on to take up the uh, kind of a governing board position in Euroscience. It's always nice to see that there are some people like you who are always so engaged and uh, always trying to help out other people. I totally agree that this is what the networks are are about. And Marie Curie is a European level program. What are the criteria for applying for this program? Marie Curie um, is a mobility program. That means you have to be internationally mobile. Uh, it means that you can have, must have spent at most 12 months of the last 36 months in the country that you will get the fellowship in. The mobility rule is, 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 is a knockout rule, so that there is no arguing with this, this rule that you cannot have spent more than a certain amount of time in the, the host country within the last few years. There's an experience rule for postdocs that they have to have at least four years research experience or have defended PhD. That at the moment, there's no age criteria. So that means that um, a researcher can be of any age. Um, I think with the increasing number of uh, applications and the, the pressure on research funding in Europe at the moment, it is likely that they will introduce some sort of age rule. It's probably not number of years of age, but the number of years after PhD was defended uh, is likely to be introduced as a rule. Um, not everybody is in agreement with that rule, but it's likely to happen. So, but in, in principle, it's a, at the moment it's very, very open, and hopefully in Horizon Europe, the upcoming program that will start in January, that it will stay as open. But um, I think with with the pressure on research budget, it, that may not be the case. All right. Thanks for explaining that. And how does one apply for the Marie Curie Fellowship? I mean, it's a very broad question because you already mentioned there are so many different types. Um, well, but, uh, I, th I think it's, it's relatively simple to explain that there are two different ways to apply. You either apply for a position on a Marie Curie Actions project. And it, so, so, for example, for the Innovative Training Networks or the CoFund projects, and for that, you should look at your access website. Um, that's https uh, colon um, forward slash forward slash your access dot ec dot europa dot eu forward slash jobs. And this website has all Marie Curie jobs that are to be advertised. And it has many other research jobs in Europe as well. So if you look at that website, you may find... Um, a Marie Curie position, you might find another position <laughs> that you're interested in. So I think that's to be recommended. <laughs> um, and for the individual fellowships, it's more complicated because you have to submit a research proposal. And at the moment, I have been reviewing research proposals for the commission. And this is, is quite, is, is, it's not very complicated if you get help if you're doing it on your own it could be very complicated but to start the process you need to find a supervisor and an institution that is willing to support your research and to build the research proposal together with you so this is not just about supporting your research it's also about your supporting your own career development so this means that you have to um, deal with a lot of the technical 
details of the proposal. And it, it is very, I mean, it is very technical, but in, you can explain it relatively quickly that one part of the proposal is um, about research excellence. So it's about, is this an innovative novel idea? Do you explain the idea well in the proposal? Um, and so on. Uh, this, and that's about 50% of the marks. And then the next part is the impact. And the impact is largely the impact for your own career. So if this is funded, is there a career development aspect to the proposal that, that shows that the institution is committed to helping you to develop as a researcher and to have a successful career afterwards? Uh, and it's also about the communication and the dissemination of the research results so that you communicate with the academic community, but also with other stakeholders, whether they be indus potential industrial partners or uh, with uh, policymakers. And it's also about communicating the results to the general public. So that is kind of bundled together as the impact. And the last part is the implementation, whether it's feasible. Uh, that your project plan if for 24 months is is possible, uh, whether it's well argued, whether it's, um, you know, I think uh, this, and this really requires you to work with your supervisor to find out what resources are available at the host institution and um, whether these will be made available to you. So to some extent, this is about using equipment in the lab or wherever, or kind of access to networks, and whether there are training courses available, say communication skills or writing patents or defending IPR or you know stuff like this. So I think this, a lot of this, a lot of this is just how you can work with other people to generate a good idea and to argue that to other people. So it's 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 really a training course on how to write a proposal for a young researcher. I think that the main problem with the individual fellowship is that the acceptance rate is about 14%. This year, there was a record number of applications, over 11,000. So in some ways, it's, it's a good experience, but I think it's a better experience to get the funding. And um, I think we would like more researchers to get it, but I think this is, um, is the reality of uh, research excellence. Yeah, I mean, 14% is really very competitive. I agree. And how was your experience in during the Marie Curie program itself? Um, my experience as a fellow was very good. Um, I was I did my fellowship at the Institute for Bioprocessing and Analytical Measurement Techniques in Heilbad Heiligenstadt in Tudringen, which is um, a part of Germany that was previously in East Germany. And uh, this was in a relatively small town um, in, in Turingen. But the, the focus of the research within, the, within this institute was very, very close to my own. There were, three, there were three research groups. One was on more or less microfluidics for biotechnology. The other was in analytical measurement techniques. And the other is in biomaterials. And I had an interest in kind of in all three pots <laughs> within the institute. So I think for me, developmentally as a researcher, it was very, very good place to work and it was very well equipped. I was initially hired in a type of project called Transfer of Knowledge Host Development Fellowships, which doesn't exist anymore. And so this, this position, this proposal was written by the institute itself and they just hired me into the project. And it was... It was a very good experience. And directly at the end of this project, I applied for another Marie Curie project, which doesn't exist anymore, called the Reintegration Grant. And it, that wasn't to, to fully fund my position. It was a, a fellowship that part-funded researchers to further develop their research. The proposal was basically set up in a way that the host institution had to show that they supported the researcher to continue their research. And it was a, a relatively small project, but um, it was also enjoyable. I could hire kind of interns from USA, uh, partly through the DAD. Um, and um, we worked together on a project that uh, eventually was, was quite successful. So I had... Good. And it was also good to give um, that if you have, as a young researcher, you have some 
um, funding available that helps you to um, to go to conferences. So if you have your own funding, it means that you have a, a lot more freedom than than a normal researcher, a normal postdoc researcher, where who has to kind of like go to the boss and ask, "Can I go to this conference?" to argue it a little bit more. Whereas if you have your own funding, it's a lot easier to uh, to plan which conferences you're going to go to and where you will present and so on. So this was really very valuable for me at the time. Um, and I mean, focusing on Germany, so many German universities and research institutes, I guess, also participate in the Marie Curie program. Uh, are you aware of other funding opportunities that someone could use to do a PhD or postdoc in Germany? Oh, definitely. That's in Germany, there are many opportunities to apply for funding for international mobility, particularly kind of a PhD level. Um, there's the DAAD, um, that's the German Academic Transfer Agency, and that they give a lot of information about um, educational opportunities in Germany. Um, I think most, they have some activities at postdoc level, but mainly up to PhD level. Uh, and, but a lot of kind of at bachelor's, master's and PhD level, there's a lot of opportunities. And some of these are short research visits, but some of them are full PhD programs as well. So I think to look at the DAD website is a very, very good idea. Also, for postdocs, that the Humboldt Foundation has a very attractive offer um, for um, postdoctoral fellowships and also for research visits and some other programs. But uh, I think if you mainly talk about the postdoctoral uh, fellowship program, that the Humboldt Foundation is, um, in, in some ways, it's very similar to the Marie Cree program. In other ways, it's different. Um, it's a lot more research focused, and this mean and the, the proposal is a lot shorter and probably easier to write. That's just three um, deadlines per year instead of one for Marie Curie, and also the acceptance rates are a little bit higher. And probably from the point of view of German institutions, the Humboldt Foundation funding is a lot easier for the institution because uh, from an administrative point of view, because it's in the German language <laughs> for them. Uh, and also that EU funding can be a little bit complicated, particularly if they haven't handled this before. But uh, I think both, both, both fellowships are very, very interesting programs. But um, I think in Germany, the, the Humboldt Foundation is... Is, is very, very well respected. And I know from talking from people who had Humboldt fellowships that they have a very big identification with the Humboldt Foundation. That in general, there's a lot of research funding in Germany, whether it's from the German Research Council or from other funders that's in Germany, much of the funding comes from the Bundesland, so the, the state in the Federation, in the German Federation. So I think that there are a lot of research opportunities and there's a, an international research marketing uh, program in Germany called Research in Germany, which uh, is focused on advertising uh, positions at German universities to uh, foreign researchers. It, it's a good idea to look into the activities of research in Germany. And I, I mean, it's, it's also that uh, if you've worked in a German lab, that there are many of the uh, PhD candidates and uh, postdocs come from foreign countries. And many Germans go abroad um, so as well, so to other countries to get experience. So I think this is just part of um, international research mobility that uh, I know coming from Marie Curie, we think that we're the only ones, but um, I think I was I, I left my country 10 years before I became a Marie Curie fellow, so I know it's, it's not completely true, um, but that we have, I think, Depending on the country, you have uh, very many researchers, particularly in Switzerland, Germany, Scandinavia, in the UK, that's uh, the Netherlands. I think the, the, the amount of foreign researchers, kind of EU foreigners or foreigners from non-EU countries among kind of uh, researchers is very high. Yeah, that's great to know that there are so many different options here. And uh, after doing the PhD or the postdoc in Germany, what do you think are some of the different career options that one has 
And I think that uh, that's it, it's it's a difficult question. It's one definitely from the Marie Curie Alumni Association that we looked at very carefully. Um, that looked at very broadly. You can make an industry career, um, which is everything in the private sector, and or you can make a career in academia. Looking at it from the point of view of Germany, that to make an academic career in Germany as a professor is quite difficult, um, even for Germans, because uh, I think the first kind of stable position you will have is a full professor, which is you have quite a lot further down the road than um, just being a PhD candidate. Um, but there are many people working in research in Germany who aren't professors as well. So I think there, there is quite a lot of research funding um, and not very many permanent positions. Against that, there is a big demand in Germany for skilled uh, employees in the private sector. So depending on your skills, uh, you may want to pursue a career in industry. And um, I think this is what we see among all early career researchers who train to PhD and maybe postdoc, that many of them make career outside academia. Just looking at it from the point of view of somebody coming from India, that to return to India to make an academic career in India is also, not, is, is also an option uh, for many people. And particularly if we look at kind of people who come to Germany for Humboldt Fellowship, many of them return, come for two years to their fellowship and return to their own country to become academics there. And that is a very, you know, very traditional career development, but it still applies to many people that they go to a foreign country, gain skills, and then return home to 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 be um, kind of ambassadors for the program in their own country and to have uh, uh, be very influential in their own countries and to contribute to education and research there. So this is, I mean, this is a choice that everybody has to make for themselves. Um, but I think in general, um, if you uh, if you have more education, more training, gain skills, that you will have an attractive career, whether that's in academia or in industry. I think this is the most important thing is that you contribute and you have a satisfying career for yourself. And that's, uh, that is the main focus. Yeah, I can totally agree with that. Um, also, you gave uh, an overview of different options for funding in Germany. So from the perspective of researchers who are coming from countries like India and other countries outside Europe, how do you think in your experience one should choose which funding to apply for? It's difficult to, to say exactly kind of because sometimes there's an, a certain amount of luck that you can focus on one type of funding and you can apply for another type of funding and, and get it. So if you were coming as a postdoc, it's not really a choice between uh, applying for Humboldt Fellowship and applying for Marie Curie. You could apply for both. Uh, I think the most important thing is that before you move to have some idea of the support you will get from the host institution and kind of how committed they are to you and to develop that relationship. Because I think applying for funding, if you're applying for a fellowship program and if you're applying for... Um, a PhD position, normally it's like applying for any other job. You, you see the opening, you apply, and you get interviewed, and you either get it or you don't. And I think at that stage, you have to make the, the choice whether you accept it or not if, you, if you're offered the position. And a lot of that is to do with personal re relationships and your, your feeling about how that's the, what the, the fellowship will offer you. And... Uh, how well you will fit into the group and how close your research interests are to the supervisor and how the supervisor and the institution will support the development of your career. Yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah, Brian, thank you very much for sharing so much valuable information and uh, your personal experiences with us on the topic of PhD and postdoc funding in Germany and in Europe. Thank you very um, much, Paris, for in inviting me to this podcast. And um, I hope that uh, what I have said is of use to your audience in India and throughout the world. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sure about that. Thank you. 
that's all folks remember to subscribe to our podcast and check out our blog at indiatogermany.com see you in the next episode